Dr. Kendrin. <laughs> um, JK, um, do you guys ever read something that's like so sexy that like you're on the train, you get like embarrassed? <laughs> that's how I felt when this next reader is amazing. And when I read her novella, Women, I got very uh, confused on the Metro North <laughs> and needed to like assess a lot of things and was in public and it was just a lot to take on. She has written a beautiful novella called Women, um, a book called, beautiful book of essays called Legs Get Led Astray. Hold it right there. And her new book now is called I'll Tell You in Person, one of my favorite writers, Chloe Caldwell. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Thanks, Lena. Um, and thank you to all these amazing readers. Uh, I'm going to read an essay, part of an essay, just the beginning from my new book, I'll Tell You in Person. It's an essay about, really, if you boil it down, it's an essay about anxiety and ambition and insecurity. So hopefully you guys can relate. Um, <laughs> with some candles and some cheese sprinkled throughout and money, or lack of money. OK, it's called Hungry Ghost. Just before Christmas, a couple of years ago, I made plans with a person whom I deeply admire. I won't say who, but I'll say this. She's somewhere on the spectrum between Eileen Miles and Beyonce. You probably admire her too, or you might hate her and think she's fat. Regardless, she is a celebrity with a capital C. I'd been infatuated with the celebrity and her art for seven years. She was going to come and sleep over at my apartment on a Saturday night. The plans had been in the making for two months, so for two months, I'd been fantasizing about it and preparing for it, posing in the mirror for the photos we would naturally take together, practicing my smile. The photos would obviously get millions and trillions of likes. <laughs> my exes would choke on their own spit when they saw. She and I would giggle and eat snacks out of bowls and lie on my newly purchased $50 futon, spilling our respective guts. Even then, I saw how ridiculous it all was. We had never met before. She was too famous to take the Amtrak. I'll take a car. The train can be a little dicey for me, she'd said. If she was in contact with me, think of the thousands of other people she was in contact with whom she'd actually met in person. It was the holidays. Wouldn't she want to spend those days with her loved ones, her family, and her boyfriend, not with me, a stranger? But she was free in early December, so I rolled with it. But how did she know I wasn't a serial killer? a rapist, a sociopath? How did she know I wouldn't have an apartment full of fans just waiting to ask her for favors and take selfies with her? We felt like we knew one another already because of our familiarity with each other's work. This is how I make most of my friends. We've read each other's work, feel like we know each other, and we get drinks. I was used to this pattern, only now the person on the other end happened to be her. The celebrity was to arrive at noon on Friday. All I'd had to eat since Wednesday were clementines because my stomach was such a mess. I had stress diarrhea. I had an anxiety ball in my chest. At night, I dreamt only of her. I had nightmares. We were out to dinner and my debit card was declined. <laughs> Not my credit card, my debit card. <laughs> I woke early with an energy similar to mania. I took walks and cleaned my apartment, wiping down counters and tables, sweeping floors, driving to TJ Maxx and walking through the aisles like a zombie, unable to think clearly, buying candles and snacks and towels, considering buying new sheets, but also knowing how irrational this was. I caught myself whistling while sweeping. I love whistling. And I remembered my brother noticing this once and telling me that the more people whistle in their lives, the poorer they will be. Think about farmers, he'd said. <laughs> I wanted to give my entire apartment a revamp, but I couldn't afford to. This was the same apartment I normally boasted about. It's the nicest and most spacious apartment I've had in the entire decade of my 20s. I become enthusiastic when people ask me about it, going so far as to say, it is the apartment of my dreams. I say that moving into this apartment was the best thing that's ever happened to me. But now I was second guessing, embarrassed about my regular apartment. One minute, I was certain she'd be super charmed by the place. It's old and quirky, good light, clawfoot bathtub. Maybe she'd want to film here. The next minute, I was horrified by the slanting old floors and mismatched bookshelves. I was mortified I still had a fucking futon. 
I always thought the first thing I'd do when I finally had money was buy a yellow couch. We'd been emailing since autumn. She'd read women and publicly supported it. She promoted it on social media and in interviews she did. On the Amtrak the morning after my book release party, I was listening to music and staring out the window when I got a notification she was now following me on Twitter. I'd already been following her for years. She sent me a message telling me she loved my book and what could she do to help. She gave me her personal email address and said, email me anytime. I began emailing her anytime. <laughs> for every email she wrote, I wrote two or three back. I called my mom, who accused me of playing an April Fool's Day joke on her, even though it was early October. This was, I thought, many female writers' wet dream. She was like the Oprah of my generation, I was living my best life. Arrogantly and embarrassingly, I assumed my career was now going to take off in ways I'd never even had the balls to wish for or let myself imagine. At the beginning of our courtship, we emailed about once a week. We emailed about different vitamins and herbs we took to stay healthy oregano oil, probiotics, fish oil. We said we should talk more about vitamins, ideally over smoothies. <laughs> we emailed about books we were reading, about musicians and comedians and writers. We need to meet, we said. We are so connected, we said. We decided that instead of meeting in New York City, she would come to where I live in Hudson. That way she could get out of the city and enjoy a mini vacation, rejuvenate. Should she do a day trip or stay over, we wondered. I vote sleepover, she emailed. I sent her links of hotels and B&Bs, but also said, or you can stay at my place. I admitted I only had a pull-out futon, but I said it would be an adventure. I was embarrassed, knowing she was used to high-end hotels. I knew it would probably be fine. She didn't expect me to be a millionaire, but I could not shake the voice of shame. Chloe thinks she's emailing once a week with you-know-who, my friend Elizabeth joked, but she's probably just getting catfished. I was cautious about telling everyone, but I told a healthy handful of people. I asked for advice. My mom told me to cut up fruit. If you cut it up and peel it, people will eat it, she said, <laughs> seemingly as stressed as I was. My friend Fran told me if she were in Hudson, she would cook beef bourguignon. Fran's comment about the beef bourguignon bothered me, not because she said it, but because I began to beat myself up for not being able to cook. It would be so cozy to convene in my kitchen with music and wine. How I wish more than anything I could cook beef bourguignon. Thankfully though, she and I planned on having cheeseburgers. She was public and shameless about also not knowing how to cook. She'd emailed me that cheeseburgers were her passion, trumped by only hot dogs. We would go out for burgers and I had two restaurants in mind. I see now that I wanted to be seen with her. Being seen, this was the seat of my life. A writer friend who is a practicing therapist as well once told me this is why writers write. They don't feel seen. When we walked to get burgers, would we be stopped on the street? I am not into celebrity gossip and spent years not knowing names of the most famous actors and actresses, but she was different. Looking at her, a woman whose birthday was a month after mine, yep, I knew when her birthday was, was like looking into the mirror and seeing a more successful version of myself. Things I bought in preparation. Three candles, lavender, plain unscented, and honeysuckle. Two kinds of cheese, goat brie, comp day. A puce green mug that read, you're an amazing woman, in a tacky font, font from TJ Maxx as a half joke. I was torn on the mug and I texted a photo to my friend Karina and asked her opinion. She will love that, it's the perfect amount of creepy, she responded. <laughs> Chocolate-covered almonds, three kinds of crackers, including, obviously, the, trendies, the trendy Mary's gluten-free kind. Baguette arugula. TJ Maxx, this is where I did my shopping. Where I live, your choices are either high as fuck end or TJ Maxx and Walmart. I went to TJ Maxx for the candles and the almonds and crackers and a pretentious cheese shop in town for the cheese and salami. I thought if I mixed shabby and fancy, no one would notice. What the fuck is a salami roll, my friend Fran later texted me. I get that shit sliced, she said. <laughs> I knew the celebrity didn't drink much, so I got something pink with a low alcohol content. I'd gone into the wine store and said excitedly, I have a girlfriend coming this weekend, I wanna get some nice champagne. When I look back on this moment, I feel totally pathetic, overambitious, and caught up in my own story. In Buddhism, the term hungry ghost refers to the person whose appetite exceeds their capacity for satisfaction. 
The visual of a hungry ghost is a Buddha ghost with a tiny mouth and an enormous stomach. They're greedy, starved for money, sex, drugs, power, status, all the good stuff, and more is never enough. Though I've done my fair share of self-work, therapy, books, yoga teacher training, meditation, I have hungry ghost tendencies that I must keep in check. When I started what I thought would be this epic friendship with a celebrity, I really did want to be close and intimate with her, but my hungry ghost started haunting my dreams, surprising even me. I'm obsessed with money. I eat, sleep, and breathe it, I told my therapist. She chuckled. What, I asked. You said the same exact thing last week. <laughs> well, it's gotten worse, I said. I'd recently noticed I talked about money and income differently than other people. I was constantly mentioning if I'd received a check I'd been waiting on or if I was still waiting for checks. I greeted people with, I got my check, or listed the checks I would be receiving in the following weeks. <laughs> no one told me about their checks or asked about mine. <laughs> but I couldn't stop offering this information like a nervous tick. I did not tell my therapist the celebrity was coming to sleep over for a few reasons. I thought I would sound grandiose, and if the celebrity canceled, I'd be humiliated. Also, I didn't want to jinx it. I'll admit, my active imagination went full force, and I did imagine sleeping and cuddling in my bed together. What would it be like brushing our teeth together? If she forgot her toothbrush, would she use mine? <laughs> would she think I was lame if I had Crest toothpaste and not Tom's, the natural kind? <laughs> would we change into our pajamas in the same room? What if we ran out of subjects to talk about? What if someone had to poop in the morning and the other person could hear or smell? Karina told me she was surprised about my nerves. I can't believe you're imagining brushing your teeth together, she said. Of course I am, I retorted. I bet she's hyper, my friend Fran said. My diet at this time consists of eggs and oatmeal and lentils and frozen bananas and peanut butter sandwiches. I put a bunch of salt and pepper on the eggs to make for a more satisfying meal, a trick my brother taught me when we lived in Brooklyn. I read books with money tips, like taking the thin paper that separates fruit at the grocery store home for toilet paper. I keep a money journal. At the end of each evening, I jot down what I have purchased and then label it bad or good or luxury, exclamation point. On the best days, I have spent zero dollars, and then I draw a smiley face. I often go into my mom's or dad's houses with a backpack when they're not home to steal necessities. I leave with an extra roll of toilet paper, some tea, a can of black beans, and a box of pasta that I'm sure they won't miss. Nothing I buy during this time in my life is purchased without panic, a raised heartbeat, guilt, shame, worry, ex existentialism, not because I am responsible, but because I am seriously broke. Not broke like I have a savings with $500 for emergencies. There is no savings, no car, no credit card, no real job, no backup plan, only rice and beans and cans of tuna. I was sweeping the floor. I was changing my sheets. I was wondering if I should buy new sheets, wondering if I should put a mint on her pillow. I was buying 3.99 candles at TJ Maxx on the verge of overdrafting my account. My friend Karina declared the sleepover meeting to be a moment in history. It's like Dylan and Hendrix meeting, she said. It's like Taylor Swift and Carly Kloss. It's like Patti Smith and Eileen Miles. This was not a comfort to me at all. And I will stop right there. Thank you so much for listening.